First of all, I just want to get a little bit of uh, stuff out of the way. Last week, um, Brittany and I, my daughter-in-law and I, had I had an opportunity to go with her up to Page, Arizona. And um, on the way home yesterday at about 2 o'clock, uh, a thunderstorm hit between Flagstaff and Ver Camp Verde, and a cliff threw a rock off at us, landed in the rock about this big. We hit it, so airbag. Okay, so I knew, I just wanted to get that out of the way. Everything's fine. God was with us in it. Oh, my goodness. It could have gone so badly, uh, you know, and he just guided Brittany. Brittany was driving, and uh, but I, I realized that I didn't want to wear long sleeves because it kind of hurt. It feels like a nasty road, road burn, and uh, I, it would kind of hurt, but I knew that it would kind of be distracting unless I t explained to you what this was. It, this looks like what, 75 times better than it did yesterday. I mean, I looked like an alien yesterday. The skin was bubbling and everything, ugh. Anyway, but everything is fine. Every single airbag in that car deployed. I didn't know cars had that, I mean, all the way around on the sides. It was just, you know, the only one that hit us was the one that in the seat that hit me because my arm was right here. But everything's fine, so God is good. God is good. So now all the road trips that I've taken all my life, and I've gone, I've gone on a lot of road trips, and I've seen those signs, watch for falling rocks. Now I know what they mean, because <laughs> they really do happen um, in a rainstorm. So watch for falling rocks. Um, but anyway, as I said, we went to Page last week. I'd never been to Page, Arizona. Man, what a beautiful place. You know, has anybody in here been to Page, Arizona, northern Arizona? Yeah, you, if you ever get a chance, go. Now, it's really interesting because it's, it's like, it's hostile country. I mean, what I mean by that is there's very little vegetation. It's desert up there, but the, the it's like red rocks and, and canyons and, of course, Lake Powell's up there. Now, I didn't go to Lake Powell, but I had a chance to see, like, the Overlook and Horseshoe Bend and and just, I mean, our hotel is right there, and then there's a canyon, you know, and that's the way Page is. It's a little bitty town, but there's, like, a neighborhood and a canyon, <laughs> you know, but the I love, I love to see the wonders of God, and it has a beauty all its own. It's beautiful beautiful. But one day while I was out in Page, like Brittany had to go to work. Um, so I was, I got Page is small enough. I could walk around and I like to walk. So I went on a walk and I came across a cemetery. And for some reason I decided to go in and I noticed a headstone in the cemetery and this is it. And when I first looked at that, I got confused because I thought, oh my goodness, somebody switched the dates around. It's wrong. You know, it's like, okay, uh, 2 2015 to 2, 4 14 91. I'm like, ooh, what a terrible mistake that would be. But then I read down there that he was a husband, father, grandfather, and great grandfather. Well, that date switch didn't make sense. He would have been too young. And I'm thinking, but wow, 2091, that hasn't even happened yet. Okay? What, does this guy know when he's going to die? That's what, and, that, and then it hit me. Oh, 1915, <laughs> not 2015. I know, right? Duh. Big blunt and blonde moment right there. I, it was just like, oh, I figured it out. But, you know, this is a great example of how we kind of get caught up in our own time and space. You know, I mean, immediately we look at 15 and think it's 2015. This is 19, oh yeah, 1915 did exist at one point in time about 100 years ago. <laughs> you know? And that, that is a great example of what I want to kind of talk about today. Because for the last few weeks, Pastor's been talking about uh, first love. Loving God first and foremost. And it's based on Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And that is a warning to the church at Ephesus. Because when the church at Ephesus, the Ephesian, that's what Ephesians written about, the Ephesian church, they started out great and they really had a fervent love for God. But the scripture tells us that they allowed the culture of their area and it was a very immoral and decadent culture. They allowed the culture of their area to seep in to their lives and the result was is that their fervent love for God had greatly diminished. And so God was telling them, remember how you loved me at one time before it's too late. You, you're going to lose it, guys. Get that passion back. And I think it's a good, good for us to, use, to look at that and take an example for ourselves and apply it to our lives today. Because even though it was written 
a couple millennia ago, the word of God is timeless. It's timeless. And it works and applies for us today. Because we live in a culture, I mean, this is something that I've noticed, that my little unprofessional brain has noticed. We live in a culture that believes that adulthood is the end of the adventure, that marriage is a prison, and that children are an inconvenience. Now, we kind of chuckle at that, but think about that with me for a minute. We live in a culture that adulthood is the end of the adventure, marriage is a, marriage is a prison, and children are an in, inconvenience. Let me see if I can tell you what I mean. Our culture believes that adulthood is the end of the adventure. We don't want to grow up. We got the Peter Pan syndrome. I don't want to grow up. I want to live in Never Never Land forever. And we value youth. We think that once we grow up, the party's over, that we can't have any more fun. That growing up means letting go of all the stuff that we want to do and be responsible adults, you know. Um, we disregard, we tend to disregard the experience and wisdom of those older than us. And that's a shame because they've made the mistakes. Why do we have to make them again? Why don't we learn from them? And hey, I got news for you. You're get headed that age today at age two. You can't stop it. You're going to be there. So it, other cultures value their elders. We need to get back to that and learn and, and, and come under their mentorship. Um, we're afraid to grow up because we think that the fun's going to be over. And have you noticed that adolescence is getting longer and longer? I mean, even in my own lifetime, when I was in high school, and here I go, when I was a kid, I walked uphill all the way to school. Um, and, you know, and, but... When, when I was, when you, when you were 18, you were out on your own, okay? But there's a phenomenon happening in our culture that adolescence is getting longer and longer and lasting, some of them, into their 30s and 40s, let's be real. Okay, they don't, okay we just won't go there. But God intends for us to grow up. He intends for us to grow up. Think about this. Let's go back to creation. Adam and Eve were, were created as adults. Okay, there's a reason for everything. They were created as adults. And in the Bible times, wrap your minds around this, all of you who have teenagers. In Bible times, when a boy turned 13, he became a responsible adult, fully responsible for all of his actions. The parents no longer were responsible for his actions, and he could get married. 13. <laughs> yeah, I know, our culture is like, who no. <laughs> Think about that. But adolescence was almost non-existent because they, the point is to grow up. We feel like if we become responsible adults, it's the end of all the fun we'll ever have in our entire life. That is a trick of Satan. I, I, I'm hoping today to kind of expose some of the strategy of the enemy. That's a trick of Satan. Because he, if he can keep us from growing up, then we don't ever become fully what God intended us to become. In addition to that, we can make some really stupid decisions that will affect us for the rest of our lives. Addictions, even jail time. I mean, we can make some dumb decisions when we're, when we're kids. But there are some benefits to becoming an adult, guys. You can drive. Okay? You can drive. You can vote. And vote we should this time, please. Please, register to vote. When you become an adult, you're more able to make responsible choices. Sure, the responsibilities are great. And there is some stress involved, but the adventure is far from over. In fact, just beginning. Because as responsible adult, as a responsible adult, God can trust you more with what he has. That's the point. The point is to get to the place where God can fully and really begin to freely use you and get you to your appointed destiny here on earth. Amen. 
You are to grow up and the fun is not over. The fun is a lie from Satan. The real adventure is with God. Let me read Ephesians chapter 4 to you. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 through 16 says, It is he who gave some to be apostles, some to prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity and faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and the cunning craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ, from the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grow and build, it grows and builds itself up. See, God has all this stuff planned for us, but we have to be willing to grow up into it. And Satan, yes, would love to keep you from that because when you become who you are meant to become, you are a threat to our enemy and the kingdom of God is advanced. Now, as an adult, the second most uh, uh, important decision you'll make is who you will spend the rest of your life with. The first more most important decision you'll make is what you're going to do with Christ. The second is who you're going to spend the rest of your life with. A good adventure is awesome, but it goes to a whole new level of epicness when you do it together. We are made for each other. And like I went to Paige with Brittany, experienced it with Brittany. It was a lot more fun to see Horseshoe Ben with somebody that I had fun with than if I had experienced it alone because somebody else could share. Photos don't even do it justice. You know, you, the, the breathtaking beauty. The, you realize how incredibly small we are <laughs> and how incredibly big God is, and this is just Earth. There's an entire universe, infinite universe out there. I mean, mind blown, God's that big. But in our culture, we tend to think of marriage more of as a prisoner, a prison than a partnership. And let me explain you what, to, to you what I mean. Think about the jokes that you hear at wedding receptions. Oh, the old ball and chain. Well, dude, it's over for you now. Why do you think they have bachelor parties? This is your last fling. What the? You know? <laughs> okay, it's like it's over now. You're in prison now. Why have we become so disillusioned and cynical about marriage? Because that's not what God intends. Now, let me just take a little side note here. There are some people who will be single for life. That is a call of God. But I'm sure that you'll agree, for the most part, for the majority, most of us will, will find someone and be married. You know. Um, so we're going to talk about marriage relationship. And for those of you who are single, just know I'm pretty sure that most of the single people here will at some point be married in their life because that's just the majority of it. Marriage is a big deal to God. Huge. Not to be taken lightly. It's a big deal to God. After all, not only did God create Adam and Eve as adults, he created them married. That was the first human relationship he created. He created them married. So why don't we see marriage as it truly is? A blessing from God. Sure, it's hard. It ain't easy. I've been married 35 years. It ain't easy. It's hard, but it is a blessing. There is something that I can't, and I'm sure Don and Claudia and John and Jolene will agree with me on this. There is something that I can't explain and put into words about the partnership that we have after 35 years of marriage, the, the stuff that we've gone through, the hard times that I'm not pleasant to give.
all over again. That doesn't make sense to me. But I'm just saying, it's worth it. When it's done God's way. It has to be done God's way. I've got, according to the word of God, since the beginning of time, the enemy's strategy has always been to get us to redefine what God says. Yeah. Here, here. Since the beginning of time. Let me show you Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Adam and Eve are skipping and running through the garden, happily married. Nothing. Can you realize everything is good? There is no sin in the world. None. Zilch. No bad decision to be made. Nothing. They don't. Nobody critic. No. No criticism. Um, I'm time out. I'm going to let him change the battery. It's going to look awkward, but but I'm going to yell while he's doing this because. I'm Because there was no selfishness. There was no animosity. There was no judgment, okay? <laughs> Told you it was going to be a little awkward. <laughs> We're all good. Okay? Understand that. We can't even imagine a world like that, can we? And then man disobeyed God, and suddenly now there's a whole slew of wrong decisions we can make. But what happened? Here's what happened. Now the serpent, this is Satan, was more crafty than any other of the wild animals so that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from the tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat it from all the fruit of the trees of the garden. But God did say, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, yeah. Satan says. You know what? God just doesn't want you to be knowledgeable. He doesn't want to, you to know what you're missing. Uh -huh. Let's redefine what God says. Yes. It, since the beginning of time, Satan has tried to get us to redefine what God says. Yes. Right. We have to stand on his word. Amen. Because God, I mean, he created marriage. Marriage any other way but how God set it up will always be disappointing. Marriage is meant to reflect the relationship that Christ has with the church. That's what it's all about. He created it so we could have more fully understand how close God wants to be with us. This creator of the universe, how close he wants to be with each one of us. The goal of marriage is not happiness, it's holiness. That's right. There is no better way to, to help you become who you were meant to become than putting one imperfect person in a close relationship with another imperfect person <laughs> and tell them to work it out according to the word of God. Yes. There's going to be some bumps along the road, <laughs> but the point is holiness. If you love your spouse, you're going to want them to become everything that God intends them to become. So you are going to, to participate in that as much as possible. And you are going to become the best thing that a man can do is love God with his whole heart and love his wife. His children will be fine. His children will be fine. That's marriage is a reflection of Christ in the church. And if marriage is a reflection of Christ in the church, then children are a reflection of us and our Heavenly Father. Yes, amen. Now, I, have, I told you, you know, marriage, the point of marriage is not ha happiness, it's holiness, and how God puts us together to cause that to happen. Well, sometimes that doesn't, that doesn't work totally, so he inserts kids to help us become un unselfish. <laughs> and usually it takes more than one. <laughs> okay, so this thing, this thing, it's, it's all God ordained. But I want to I know when kids enter the picture, okay, parents, doesn't that change everything? Yeah, yeah and, and those of you who don't have kids, you know, Belinka and David, didn't it change everything? Do you remember what it was like before your child? I don't. 
don't. I don't. I feel like I've had kids forever. You know, because that it cha- as you grow and together as a family, you know, sure, it's hard. It's like, you know, I, I saw a comedian the other day, and he was saying, you guys without kids, you don't understand. Things are different, like simple things, little things, like leaving the house. Those of you who have no kids, you can do. You want to leave the house? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> Parents, when you leave the house, go get your shoes. Where's your coat? Where's the thing? Get out of here. Are you awake? Just wake up. We got to go. Honey, get over here. Am I right? Okay. It becomes a lot more complicated. But children are a reflection. They, they are a reflection of, our whole, of how our Heavenly Father is for us. Okay, I've learned more about God the Father from my children than I could ever learn anywhere else. I mean, I remember thinking, I didn't know I could love something this much and be so angry at him at the same time. (laughs) You know? You know? It's like weird. And then when I got the second one, I'm like, oh man, am I going to have enough love for, I've got all my heart invested in this first one. What about Sean? But suddenly you realize when he comes along, you love them just as much and you realize, oh, God loves everyone. Just, I get it now. He, there's enough room in there. Your heart just gets bigger and bigger with everyone. You know, and some of you have six of them, so <laughs> it's really big. <laughs> That's the end. No. <laughs> you know, but with our children, I mean, they're such a joy. They're a gift from God. But really, in our culture today, it's really, really easy. And I get it to get distracted with the clutter of life and trying to survive and trying to make it to work on time and trying to create an income for your family and make a living and, and do all this stuff, you know, and take care of our children and our wife, our house, and the water heater broke and the, the car ran over a rock and, you know, whatever. And take care of everything that, that caring for children can feel become like a grind or an inconvenience. Or our relationships fall apart and we get hurt. And almost unknowingly, our children become bargaining chips in the process, in nasty battles. Is it any wonder that some of the, some of the people who are watching us with our children are putting it off till later? It's kind of scary. They feel like they're not ready or ever will be ready. But that's not what God intends. Children are treasures from God. And Psalm 127 says this, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early and sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Now it's talking about busyness here. And then note, in context with this, making a living in busyness and getting distracted, he puts in, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children in one's youth. Happy is the man whose quiver is full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with their enemies in the gate. We begin to realize our children are treasures from God and the strategy for building his future kingdom. Yes. <laughs> They're that important. Right. Yes, amen, amen. Okay, so how do we get where God wants us? Because, phew, really, guys, it's hard. Clutter, life, stuff. How do we get where God wants us? I love the book of Proverbs. I love the book of Proverbs. I read a, pro- I read a little bit of Proverbs every day. I can't read an entire chapter. There's too much. But I read a few verses of Proverbs every day. And just cycle through when I get done. I challenge you to do that. Because there's so much there. So much wisdom. That's what it's about. Solomon wrote most of them. He was the wisest man who ever lived. So might as well listen to him. Proverbs chapter 24 verses 3 through 4. Through wisdom a house is built. And by understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Let's break this down a little bit. Through wisdom, a house is built. Now, this is not the wisdom of the world. This is the wisdom that comes from God. And Proverbs also says that through wisdom, God built the universe. 
That's some powerful wisdom. It's worth tapping into. When we become in a relationship with Christ, this wisdom becomes available to us. It, he doesn't try to hide it from us. He doesn't try to keep it from us. James tells us, is anyone lack wisdom? Ask. God will give it to you liberally. Yes. He'll get, he wants, why wouldn't he want you to be wise? Yes. Our, our assignment is to build his kingdom. We need wisdom to do that. Our assignment is to build our families and our homes. We need wisdom to do that. Of course he's not going to keep it from you. Ask. And it's that kind, that's the wisdom that we're talking about. It's not man's wisdom. Psalm chapter 111 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And a good understanding have those who have, keep his commandments. What it boils down to is that true wisdom or the, begins with the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is simply submitting to the will of God. That's what it is. Simply submitting to the will of God. That's wisdom. And wisdom is, it, it is knowing what is pure and right and true. But it goes beyond that. It's also acting upon sound judgment or making right choices. It is doing just action or acting. It gives you the, the ability to act and react in the right way. And it's insight. And this only comes from God. Have you ever been in a situation where there's like drama going on, you know, or, you know, no, not at all, uh, you know, or like you're dealing, maybe you're dealing with a teenager, or maybe you're in a relationship, you're dealing with a relationship problem or something, and what you're really talking or discussing strongly about, you know in your heart that that's not the issue. There's something underneath. Okay, listen to that. That's the Holy Spirit giving you wisdom, saying that's insight. Let's get to the real issue. And it'll be solved much quicker. Amen. Get to the real issue. That's insight. In other words, wisdom is simply putting your faith in Christ and going all in. Going all in. All in. Amen, amen. With all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. All in. It doesn't work any other way. A um, friend of ours, Jay Leach, who's a uh, Hollywood musician, studio musician, um, does a lot of commercials, The Voice, things like that. Um, He's in that entertainment industry, and he served God all this time. And he said to our worship team one day, he had a chance to talk to our worship team, he said, you know, he kind of talks like a beach boy. <laughs> you know, you, you know, cats, let me tell you. <laughs> he does, he's, cool. he's a cool dude. He goes, dude, you know, serving God is the, I've served God all these years. And he said, serving God is the grandest adventure if you do it with all you have. If you only do it halfway, it's a rough ride, man. You got to be all in. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to be free from trouble, but it does mean that you're going to get through it and God's going to use it Amen. to get you to your destiny. Amen. How does this play out in our lives? Well, with, through wisdom, we commit to personal growth, spiritual growth, it, personal growth, spiritually, financially, physically, mentally, emotionally. We have to grow. We don't rely on our own limited strength and understanding or point of view. Instead, we rely on a supernatural strategy for building our relationships and our homes and our finances. Did you hear that supernatural strategy? Yes, God has a strategy. He's willing to get supernatural strategy. And we never lose sight of the great privilege that it is and responsibility to teach, but more importantly, to model before our children the word of God. That's how wisdom plays out. Second part of that verse. And by understanding, it is established. Understanding is comprehension or a grasp of a concept. Then the thing that we need to grasp or take hold of is that God's way is the best way. Amen. God's way is the right way. Yeah. There is no other way. Amen. It's that simple, guys. Amen. And Satan keeps trying to tell us that there's a better way, that there's another way. And as long as it works, he's going to use that strategy, guys. Let me tell you, it's worked since the beginning of time. He's still using it today. But we, understanding is realizing, wait a minute, no matter how good that looks, 
no matter how desperately I want out of this situation and I want to go into that situation, no matter how desperately I want to grab and take hold myself and do it myself, God's way is the best way. I'm going to have faith, walk by faith, not by sight, walk this thing out, get to the other end and look back and go, oh, yeah, I'm glad I made that choice. Instead of, oh, what did I do? That's the difference. That's, un, that's grasping the concept that God's way is the best way. We, we begin to comprehend, understand, comprehend that God is not a taker. No. He's a giver. Woo, Why do we believe that God wants to take from us? What he wants to take from us is the crud we don't need. But he's a giver. Yes. And he's not even an, an adder. He's a multiplier. We have to hang on to that concept. It's not about here. It's about eternity. That's comprehension. The understanding the bigger picture. And keep that in mind. Then you know that the bumps in the road. (laughs) Yeah, bumps in the road like I hit yesterday. (laughs) You're going to get through it. Wow, that was a big one, wasn't it, Brittany? (laughs) Bumps in the road. You might get a little bit hurt every once in a while, but you'll get over it. You'll get through it. You'll get a brand new car, and God will get you home. Amen. In time to come to, his, to church and preach the word. <laughs> okay. Uh, could have been a whole different scenario if God hadn't been in it. Okay. <laughs> you get this understanding. You know, that's what it's all about. And we understand that marriage done God's way is the best way, and it's good as long as we keep God in it. It's good. We, it's a rewarding journey. And we grasp the fact that our kids are not only gifts from God, but agents, future agents for him. Okay? In his kingdom. And our time with them is limited. We understand that. We only have them for a short time. Mamas, It's not God's will that you hang on to those babies until they're 40. I have news for you. Your job is to get them to adulthood responsibly. (laughs) And and God has them. God has them. He knows knows them more than you do. He knows them more than you do. He loves them more than you do, believe it or not. Because he's got a plan for them. He sat down way back ago at the beginning of time. Saw, two, saw, saw August, September, or August, almost September, 2015, and he said, hmm, this is what I'm going to be doing here. Okay, I'm going to need to have Jose born here <laughs> and insert him here as my agent. Yes. Way back when. Because what does Ephesians say? That we are to do the works which Christ has prepared beforehand for us to do and walk in them. He's way more detailed than you think he is. And so we are given the responsibility of the children for 18 years, let's just say. Some of them stay longer. (laughs) Some of them come back. But but generally for 18 years. And I was going to have an illustration up here, but I was busy getting in a car accident yesterday, so um, I didn't get the illustrations. But here's what I, I, I read this somewhere. This is awesome. For you who have children... Okay, if you're about to have a child, get a big jar and put 938 marbles in them. Okay, if your child, okay, that is one marble for every week of the year. 52 uh, marbles every year for 18 years. Okay, if you already have children, you can do the math and put that amount of marbles into your jar. At the end of every week, take one marble out. This is a good illustration as you watch the marbles dwindle of how much time you have with your children, and it puts things in perspective. It'll keep you in perspective. So I challenge you to do that. Proverbs 16.22 says, Understanding is a wellspring of life to him who has it, but the correction of fools is folly. Those who get understanding have this access to this living water that never runs out. It's a wellspring of life. You got to have it. Third part of that verse, 
By knowledge, the rooms are filled with precious and pleasant riches. Knowledge is an acquaintance or familiarity with a truth. An acquaintance or familiar, you're familiar with a truth. What is the truth? The word of God. And John says the word is Christ. He's the living word. The truth is the word of God. You need to have a knowledge of the Holy One. You need to have grow in your knowledge of the word of truth. You need to spend time reading his word. It's not just something that we pastors, when we sign up, we have to, I will promise to preach, read the word. You know, that's, we mean it. it it's true. Moses told the children of Israel, it is your life. Yes. Yes, amen. Spend time in the word. Spend time in prayer with him. And go ahead and pour out your heart, but just spend time listening to so that you can learn how he speaks to you. He will speak to each one of you in an individual way because he knows you best. And he won't speak to you the way he speaks to me. He'll speak to you the way that he speaks to you. And you can only discover that by spending time with him in prayer. And then spend time. Make the effort to spend time with your spiritual family because we are made to do this thing together, guys. We can't do this on our own. We need help. I need for you who have gone through some of the stuff that I, I'm going through to, to encourage me and say, I, I get it. You'll get there. You need for me to tell you what to do in case you hit a boulder on the road, okay? I can help you. I've done it. Okay? And by growing in the knowledge of God, oh, man. You grow in your knowledge of who he is. And the more you know, the more you don't know. He gets bigger, and he gets bigger, and he gets bigger, and he, you realize how much he loves you. And you begin to understand not only who he is, but who you are in him. And when you realize that, you think, man, what can me and him do together? It's, there's nothing impossible for you and God to do together. And you only get that by spending time with him and growing in your knowledge of who he is. John, that's why I'm beginning to fully understand what John 8.32 says. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. That verse has layer. Those simple words have layer upon layer upon layer upon layer for us to discover. Keep, keep discovering because it gets deeper, guys, and gets richer, the truth that you know. It gets deeper and richer. Don't ever stop learning about God. So we've been talking about first love. We should love God first and foremost. But the amazing thing is, the more we know God, the more we come to an understanding of how he loves us, that that in itself is the best reason that we love God. Because he loved us first. John said it best in 1 John 4, 19. We love him because he first loved us. And that's the best reason of all. And if you take anything with you today, I want you to take these true truths with you. The best way is God's way. And God is for 